So the history of the King James Bible, or as it's known in England, uh, the King James Version or the Authorized Version or the King's Bible, uh, uh, the world's bestseller, the best selling book of all time has um, many names. And it's only Bible in English that's also named after the sovereign, the king uh, who was uh, reigning at the time of his uh, publishing. Um, now, in 2011, uh, this Bible had a 400 year jubilee. And, and the National Geographic magazine had a special edition in that uh, regard. And it called it, it said that no other book has given uh, so much to the English speaking world. Um, so it's the most important book in the English speaking world that has influenced uh, not only the English speaking world a lot, but uh, all of Western uh, society, we could say. Now the history of the King James Version starts with the history of the English Bible. And that history starts with some very brave men. Um, in the um, medieval times, uh, the establishment of society was, uh, you could say, divided between three forces. That was the king, and then it was the nobility, and then it was the church. And these uh, kind of uh, had a mutual uh, cooperation, you could say, supporting each other uh, to uh, control uh, society. And in that uh, society, uh, the Bible in the vernacular languages, that is the modern languages that most people could uh, understand, was seen as a threat to the establishment. So uh, there was no interest in having the Bible translated into languages that people could understand. The Bible at the time was more or less the, the Vulgate uh, Bible in Latin, which was a language that the educated classes intellectuals and the nobility and the king would understand, but not uh, people at large. Then things start to happen in England at the, towards the end of the, of the 1300s, uh, inspired by a professor at Oxford, professor of theology, John uh, Wycliffe, who um, is, has been called the morning star of the Reformation. What a for, he was a forerunner of the Reformation and uh, he thought that the Bible should be shared with all people and it should be translated into uh, languages that people could understand. And he <coughs> so that uh, people themselves could have a direct relationship with God that was not dependent on the church or someone else to go in between. And he inspired um, a group of um, followers, we could say, who became known under the name of uh, Lollards. And um, we believe that it was not him, he himself who translated the Bible that was translated from the Latin into English. The first translation was very literal and very Latinized. Uh, the, the, the second was a bit more idiomatic um, and easier to, to read. But, we, but, but believe he was the one who inspired it and it was his followers who translated translated uh, the Bible. Um, Wycliffe uh, had some uh, powerful friends, uh, the brother of the king that protected him. So uh, although they were, he had a lot of enemies, they were not able to get um, at him. But in 1415 at the church meeting in Constance, um, many of his teachings uh, were branded as heretical and uh, it was given order that his uh, bones should be uh, dug up from his grave uh, and thrown into the river. He was not uh, seemed to worry of having a Christian uh, grave. But the inspiration, his inspiration um, carried on. Uh, down in Czechia, a, a man called Jan Hus uh, picked up his ideas and took it uh, further. 
After the death of Wycliffe, there's an interesting development. Um, English start to replace French more and more in England or in the upper classes, because after uh, Norman the Conqueror had conquered um, England, French had been the language of royalty and nobility. Um, but then uh, French started by and by to give way to, to English. Uh, you would have get a new class that would challenge the, this establishment that uh, we talked about, and that was the merchants. It was a, a growing class of merchants that did not have uh, any background from nobility, anything uh, like that. And merchants at that time, like businessmen today, they are interested in open societies, open borders where, where business and commerce can flow uh, free, freely. And they... Uh, also uh, took these ideas and were the first among the first to pick up the ideas of, of, of reformation when that um, came. We also had a printing revolution starting with Gutenberg and the Gutenberg Bible in the 14 um, uh, in, 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 in 14 fifties uh, uh, which made mass distribution of uh, printed uh, books uh, possible. We got to humanism uh, with, a renew, uh, with an interest for the original languages of the Holy Scriptures, like the Hebrew and, and the Greek. Um, you would get uh, professorships of Greek, for instance, uh, at the University, University of Oxford in the early 1520s. Um, and then you would also get the Reformation uh, started uh, uh, in 1517 by Martin uh, Luther and of course with the, uh, the inf Reformation came the translation of the Bible into many la modern uh, languages started with Luther's own translation of New Testament into German from Greek in 1522. So uh, we all of these things that happened were very important for development of the Bible and also for the English Bible. About a hundred years after Wycliffe died, um, the, the one we can call the father of the English Bible, William Tyndale uh, was born. And uh, he, like uh, Wycliffe, and most of those we're talking about here in the early history of the Bible, um, like Martin Luther also, uh, we're all uh, uh, educated within theology, and we're uh, priests. But William Tyndale at an early age, before he started to translate uh, the Bible himself, once said to uh, a group of, of clergymen, if God spares my life for a few years, I'll see to it that the boy pushing the plow knows more of the Bible than you do. And that promise he fulfilled. We, um, I have here, uh, we can say the, the outline of, of William Tyndale's life. Um, it was not a very long life. We don't actually know exactly when he was born. It could have been between 1491 and 1494. We don't know what he looked like either. There's no contemporary portraits of him. But at least we know that he was born in Gloucestershire on the border to Wales in, in England. And he, at an early age, went to Oxford and then later to, to Cambridge, uh, where he took a master's in, in theology. And he was, became an ordained uh, priest. Uh, about the time he gave that quote, uh, said that to the clergyman, he was a family pastor and, and, and teacher to um, a rich family. Then he went to London to try to gain the support of the Bishop of London to, uh, for his support, uh, uh, support in translating the New Testament from Greek to English, because the Bishop of London, Tunstall, was a um, friend of the, the um, humanist, great humanist Erasmus, but uh, the Bishop would see nothing of it. Uh, there was a ban against translating the Bible into English. So uh, Tyndale left the continent I left uh, England for the continent and he never returned to um, England. He went first to, it's believed, to Hamburg where he started his translating work. 
And then in 1525, made the first attempt to print the New Testament. Had to be aborted uh, in chapter 22 of a book of Matthew because the Inquisition raided the printery. Um, there's only one remain, remaining fragment of that book today, and that is in the British Library in London. Um, so if you are in London now, you can go and, and see it, well, tomorrow. Well, maybe you can't, if, maybe the British Library is probably, maybe close now also, but when it opens then. But the year after, in 1526, he was able to, to print the whole New Testament in a beautiful copy. It's a, what, three copies of this in the world. This is the only one that's hand uh, colored. And only two of those copies are um, complete. One of them in the British Library also. Uh, really one of the most important uh, books in the, in the history of Bible uh, translations. Made uh, very small, so it could be easily smuggled, because it was smuggled with merchants on the ships to England from um, a port like Antwerp or Hamburg, in the in the bottom of uh, or, or sacks of uh, cloth or, or or corn or, or whatever. The um, Bishop of London got wind of this. And they started to confiscate um, New Testaments. Those who were taken with that on them or in their home uh, really got into trouble. They could actually risk being uh, executed uh, for it. Um, in order to be able to um, get hold of more, uh, he, the bishop started to buy uh, Testaments also. And so that he could gather a great bonfire outside St. Paul's Cathedral, um, where they burnt and um, many of these um, Greek, uh, these uh, uh, English New Testaments. But um, um, Tyndale, you know, he, what he said was that, uh, well, uh, with the money that I get now from the, the bishops in England, I can make uh, improved uh, editions. And that he did. In 1530, he was the first to translate uh, the Pentateuch, that's the five books of Moses, from Hebrew into English. And then in 1534, he revised his New Testament before the year, year after he was lured into a trap and arrested uh, in Antwerp, where he had spent a few years before that and imprisoned uh, in a prison at Vilvorda, which today is outside, just outside of, of Brussels by the airport. He was in prison for 18 months and it's believed he continued to translate the Old Testament books from Hebrew into English while he was there. Around the time of his imprisonment, um, another uh, priest, Miles Coverdale, actually um, had the, Bible, the complete Bible printed in English in Antwerp. He took all that Tyndale had translated and combined it with his own translation uh, from Latin because Coverdale didn't know uh, Hebrew. Um, so he took uh, Tyndale's uh, New Testament and, and the books like the Pentateuch and other books of the Hebrew scriptures Tyndale had translated and put it together with his own uh, version of, of, of the Psalms and the other books. And then the first complete English Bible was printed. Um, after 18 months, uh, Tyndale was convicted of heresies and he was uh, strangled out of mercy before he was uh, burned in 1536. The year after, in 1537, the so-called Matthew's Bible was, um, was um, uh, published. And that was published by a friend of Tyndale, John Rogers, who took all of Tyndale's um, translations and, and put it together in, in, in a Bible. And that was the first that was kind of given with like, a, like an official approval of the authorities in England. So 
I already mentioned this about the first printed uh, New Testament from translated from the Greek into English of, of Tyndale of 1526. So translated from the 1519 edition of Erasmus's Greek New Testament. We'll return to Erasmus and, the Greek, and his Greek Testaments in the next talk in English on March uh, 1st. So I hope you can join us um, for that talk. Um, so Tyndale was not only a master with English language, but he was, I mean, he was great with languages at large, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, French, German, Italian, and, and Spanish. So you could say he was like a linguistic uh, genius. This is the 1535 covered, uh, Coverdale uh, Bible. You see it there, front page to the right. Up on the top there, you see the, the Tetragrammaton, that is the, the, um, the name of God in the, with the Hebrew, four Hebrew letters. And first time for that uh, to appear on the, on the front page of a Bible in English. And this is the 1537 Matthew's Bible. And as I said, it was set forth with the king's most gracious license. So although Tyndale was still a no-no word in England, this was Tyndale's Bible and now uh, blessed with the king's uh, license. Uh, John Rogers, who published it, became the first martyr under the reign of Bloody, Bloody Mary when he was burned in 1555. In 1539, we get the first so-called uh, official uh, Bible of the, of the Church of England. And this is um, done by, edited by Miles Coverdale, who took, who took uh, Tyndale's translations and uh, then combined uh, with the, his, his own previous translations. The huge uh, volume, that's why it's called the Great Bible made for church, for the, for the pulpit. It was not made for the ordinary people to read. It was meant to be read from the pulpits in the churches. And you can see this, this copy, hand-colored title page, is believed to have belonged to King Henry VIII himself. We see him there at the center, um, then distributing the word of God to the, to the masses. Uh, at this time, uh, the king had broken with the Pope, broken off with the Pope. You probably know something of that, uh, that story. Uh, so uh, there was no longer any Pope between the king of England and God. It was, it was uh, the king was now only subjected uh, to, to God. And this is, then uh, you could say, um, uh, advertised on this title page. This is propaganda. In 1560, um, we come to one of the really most important, not only English Bibles, but of all the translations being made in the 16th century, the Geneva Bible. The, the prehistory to that is that um, after Henry VIII uh, died, uh, his son Edward became king. He had a poor health and his reign only lasted something like uh, uh, four years um, before he died. And then his uh, sister, Mary, became queen. And she was a very, very devout Catholic and wanted to take everything back to uh, the old days. Um, so uh, a great persecution uh, started burning of not only Bibles, but also the translators and, and people who read them. Um, so you would get, get a lot of religious refugees. And many of them went down to Geneva, where uh, John Calvin uh, had established himself and his, and his church, uh, where there was um, uh, a milieu for Bible translation and Bible printing. So, uh, a group of English scholars and translated uh, the Bible, first the Greek New Testament by, by Whittingham in 1557, and then the whole Bible in 1560. Now, the New Testament was a revision of, of, of Tyndale's. 
Um, so they made good use of, of Tyndale's work and also, also looked to Coverdale. Coverdale was also part of this group in Geneva, by the way. Mm, but it was the first time that the complete Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into English. It's also the first time uh, that you had an English Bible with the uh, verse uh, numbering. It was uh, the first time you had a, actually had an English Bible, complete Bible that was made for uh, the, the reading and study of ordinary people. The size was a quarto, it was not a huge uh, folio. Uh, it had a lot of study aids, illustrations, uh, etc. Et so it became hugely popular with um, uh, and more than 150 editions were issued in the time than the last actually uh, in 1644. And when we talk about those who went to the pilgrims who went to America on the Mayflower, all those were Puritans, so they would have this Geneva Bible um, with them. And uh, Shakespeare is known for having used the Bible a lot in his place. He's quote, he quoted from the Bible more than a thousand times. And the majority of those quotes are from the Geneva uh, Bible. So we have a complete Geneva Bible um, exhibited at the museum. It's, um, it's a beautiful book uh, far ahead of its time. It was also not in black letter like the other English Bibles, but it was in, in, in Roman, uh, like you could see here on, on the title page. So it was easier to, to read. Yeah, here we see it, see one of the maps in it. Now, as I said, this um, 1560 Geneva Bible became hugely popular. So the, um, that was not to the um, English church liking, the bishops liking. So they produced an um, alternative themselves in 1568, which was an, a, a rev revision of the Great Bible from 1539. Uh, uh, so this was in the reign of Elizabeth, who replaced um, Mother Mary after she had died after a, a short, also reign of about four, five years. Um, and we see the queen here in the middle, but she never kind of uh, sanctioned uh, the, the Bible. She was very careful with the balance when it came to religious uh, terms too. Um, so, um, uh, but it's at least it's uh, her here on the, on the title page. So here is um, a timeline of the Bible in English. Uh, we have, we started by looking at the Wycliffe Bible, and then we look at, uh, looked at four Bibles during the reign of Henry VIII. Um, and, and, the, um, and we see that the, the, the Tyndale translations, they influence all the following translations, um, including those that came under the reign of Elizabeth. Uh, in 1560, uh, Geneva, and then 1568, the bishops. And this leads us up to uh, the main uh, role of this talk, we could say, the main book, the 1611 King James um, uh, Bible. But it's important to note the influence of William, of one man in particular, William Tyndale. And it's calculated about uh, um, 80 percent of the New Testament in the King James Version goes straight back to, to Tyndale. And then uh, a somewhat smaller percentage of the Old Testament, but still a very large percentage of, of, percentage of that as such. So um, the, the, the new translation here is actually Tyndale from the Greek, and then we get the Geneva from the, uh, and, and Tyndale also from the Hebrew, and then Geneva rest up from the, the Hebrew. Uh, and the others are more or less uh, just uh, revisions, including the 1611, which we will return to. But before 1611, we have the year 1603. That's important here because in that year, the queen dies. She's still um, um, the virgin queen. She never married, never had any children. So her, a relative of her, 
uh, the king of Scotland, James the Fourth of Scotland, he becomes then the king. James of uh, England, Scotland, Ireland, and France. The first king to rule over both England and Scotland is James. Uh, he has been had been lusting for English throne for some time, uh, because Scotland was poor and uh, England was rich. Let's take a look at the background of James. Born in 1566, died in 1625. Um, did he have a happy childhood? Well, his mother or a life? Well, his mother was beheaded. His uh, son, who became king after him, was beheaded. His father was murdered, uh, but he's also one of the most learned on the English throne, fluent in uh, languages like uh, Latin and, and Greek. Yeah, so as I said, he was born in 1566 as the son of Mary, of Queen Mary of, of, of Scots or, or of Scotland and Lord Darnley. Name was real name was Henry Stuart, so that's where he, his last name came from. He, at the age of one, he he was removed from his mother when she was removed as as queen, and then he became king, one year old. Was raised in Calvinistic foster homes. It was like um, he was a, a, a pawn in a political game. That was. His, how his life started out. His father was murdered in 1567. Um, and it's believed that uh, the, the mother's lover was involved in that murder. And then she herself was executed in 1587 on the order of her cousin, Queen Elizabeth, um, because uh, the, but the mother, Mary, she was believed to have been involved in a uh, in a planned coup d'etat uh, to restore Catholicism in England and put her on the throne instead of uh, Elizabeth. So, what kind of person does is shaped by such a, a childhood? Well, that that's something we can um, contemplate, isn't it? Um, but. What we know about him, you know, I said that he was uh, like an intellectual, one of the most learned on, on the on the um, throne, um, was that, well, he was no soldier. Uh, he, he didn't um, go for that, but he was a very eager hunter. Uh, and um, he was obsessed with this divine right uh, to rule. In the Geneva Bible, which James didn't like because of the footnotes, many footnotes, it, uh, because of some of the footnotes it had, um, he criticized um, strongly uh, in, 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 the, um, in the Geneva Bible, uh, there was a footnote that criticized the um, the Hebrew midwives in Egypt. And they have been ordered by Pharaoh to kill old uh, newborn males among the, um, the Hebrews, which they uh, refused to do. And, uh, and, and when they were uh, called in before Pharaoh, they claimed that the, um, the women gave birth so quickly that uh, they had all given birth before midwives were able to reach them. Now, the, the Geneva Bible criticized them for, for lying. But the king, King James, he criticized them for not obeying Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh was the king and a king should be obeyed at all costs. So they should have killed uh, the babies. Well, what then would have happened to the Moses and the, <laughs> and the further story of Exodus and Israelites? Um, that is another matter if they should have followed uh, what James thought they should have done. But it says a lot about him. 
and uh, his obsession with the divine right to, to, to rule and the king should be obeyed. And that was, was what was later got his uh, son, Charles I, into trouble and actually led to the, the civil war in England and uh, Charles himself being dethroned and beheaded by Cromwell. Now, let us now go to the year 1589 and, and a royal wedding in Oslo. The Bible Museum is in Oslo and we like to try to, well, uh, uh, use local things connected to the Bible. Um, and, and this is one of them. Um, because um, uh, the, uh, the Scottish king, at this time he was 23 years old, and he needed to prove himself a man. He had a reputation for liking um, uh, good-looking um, men. Uh, so he had something to prove there with women. And also a, a Scotland needed to settle some old death with the Kingdom of Denmark. So there was arranged marriage between uh, James and uh, Anne the uh, daughter of Frederick II, King Frederick of the Second of, of, of Denmark. Now she, um, uh, the, um, the king died the year, the King of Denmark died the year before and his son Christian IV then became king at an age of um, 12 years or he was 11 uh, well, or 12 when it became uh, king. And then in 1589, um, Anne herself was uh, 14. Well, she actually uh, had her 15th birthday the day after um, the wedding. Well, the wedding was supposed to take place in, in Scotland, uh, but uh, the princess wasn't able to make it to Scotland because of very, very bad weather. Um, she had to, they had to abort after several attempts and she ended up in Norway and in Oslo. Um, so the king, uh, King James, uh, he grew impatient. So I ended up with him uh, coming over uh, to Norway and to Oslo, where they met for the first time. And it's said to have been love at uh, first sight. And they actually spent about a month here in Oslo. He would go hunting out here at Hovedøya, one of the islands here in Oslo. Where they, would, where they would put out rabbits so there was enough for him to, to, to hunt. And then they would have the, the marriage. Um, of course, um, Oslo wasn't very suitable. Uh, it was a small place. So they went overland um, to Sweden, uh, through Sweden, uh, to Denmark, where you would have the, the great uh, celebrations. Um, and um, James, uh, one of his interests was actually in um, witchcraft. That is, he, uh, <laughs> he, he uh, saw it as a great enemy. Um, and um, of course, uh, witchcraft had to be involved in all these storms that had almost uh, ruined um, his prospects of getting married. So uh, a number of, of women confessed to being uh, witches and were, were burned uh, for, for that. So that was also part of these times. Now, this um, trip proved to be the only trip that James ever had outside uh, Scotland and and England. So after they returned together to Scotland, uh, the princess, so I mean now the queen of Scotland is, uh, is crowned. And then as I said in 1603, they became coming king and queen of, of also of um, England. Now, when, Ing when uh, James comes to England, it's uh, it's a country where religion is um, is part of totally part of politics, and um, the, the the Puritan fraction of the church that is those that wanted to take the church back to its very simple start 
and no use of images or uh, crucifixes, crosses, uh, anything like that. Um, where a kind of in uh, opposition to the ruling party in, in the church, which was a mix, a kind of a something in between Protestantism or Lutheranism, I mean, and the uh, and Catholicism, the Anglican uh, Church. So uh, they they agree upon a, a conference uh, that takes place outside London in 1604. It takes out place outside London because inside London there is um, uh, the plague roaming about killing people. Um, and there the Puritans uh, say that there is a need for a new Bible because the Bishop's Bible is not good. It's, it's not um, towards their, their liking and it's uh, very subjective. So the, the King agrees um, to that, that they shall make um, a new uh, version of the Bible and, uh, and uh, he is believed to be personally involved in setting up the rules for that um, Bible. Uh, it's 15 rules. We'll take a quick look at them. But the point here is continuity, actually. They're not to make a new translation. They are to make the old one better. And the old one, that is the Bishop's Bible. That is what their, uh, really their assignment uh, is. Um, and that is the rule number one. That is the, the Bishop's Bible is the one that they shall uh, revise. And they shall keep old church words like a church and not use the word congregation like the Purit Puritans would like. Or to use priest and not the word elder like the Puritans would like, for instance. But if they find that... Um, other translations are more in line with the Greek and the Hebrew than the Bishop's Bible, then they are free to, to take that into consideration. And it shall not, uh, not have any marginal notes. James don't, will no, don't, doesn't want any kind of uh, po politics affixed to it, but only those that uh, did directly with the Hebrew or Greek words with alternative uh, meanings. And in Rule 14, they list the, uh, uh, um, the old English translations that they can look to when it comes to the revising. And see, it starts with Tyndale's. They were divided. They were organized like a real project. Um, and they were divided into six uh, companies at the three main sites of, of a church or learning at Westminster, Oxford, and... Uh, and Cambridge. 54 men, about 54 men altogether, were uh, in 1604 given 40 unbound copies of the Bishop's Bible of the latest edition of that, the 1602 edition. Of these 54 men, all were members of the Church of England, and 53 were ordained priests. Only one was not an ordained priest. Most of them uh, scholars at universities or um, or uh, bishops um, and it's one aut uh, one of the authors of a book on the history of the King James Bible pointed out this and he said it's sometimes assumed that people in the 21st century know more than people of the 17th century but in many ways the opposite is true the population for which scholars can now be drawn is much larger than that of the 17th century. I mean, in England today, there is about 60 million people, right? At this time, it was only, the population was less than on, on Norway. So maybe only 4 uh, million people, 4 or 5 million people, something like that. But like he says, it would now be difficult to put together a group of more than 50 scholars with a range of languages and knowledge other disciplines that characterize the King James translators. We may live in a world with more knowledge, but it is populated by people with less knowledge. And then it gives an example that in the preface to the King James Version, it says that in most learned men's libraries, you can find the, um, the New Testament in, uh, in Syriac, 
and the the psalms book of psalms in in arabic and you don't do that anymore that's for sure you could just take a quick sample of two of the translators uh, from the first westminster company who had among uh, them responsibility for the uh, book of genesis for instance you have um the bishop lancelet Andrews to the to the left he is one of the recognized as one of the most learned men of all of Europe at his time. He was in charge of the of the first translation company, and it was also later one of the few men who sat in the final uh, revision uh, committee. He mastered a, a lot of modern languages in addition to ancient languages like um, uh, like. Um, uh, uh, Greek, uh, Hebrew, uh, Latin, of course, um, and um, uh, Arama uh, Aramaic and uh, Syriac, uh, etc. To the right is, is someone who doesn't have the same kind of intellectual profile, but I, I, I took him because it's interesting. Um, uh, he uh, he not only knew. Uh, the original languages, but he was also an architect. So it's believed that he gave input to things that have to do with architecture, like for instance, the, the temple, the tabernacle descriptions of those. But I found it interesting that um, um, he had also been on some uh, explorations to the West Indies, um, where um, he um, in 1593 visited the island of Dominica. At that time, uh, the West Indies, the Caribbean, was seen as uh, paradise to, to Englishmen. Uh, so it's interesting that he was part of those that translated the Genesis to the creation account. And he must have thought of um, what he saw there in the Caribbean, which was unspoiled at the time, a paradise, um, when, he, when they translated um, the uh, tra the creation account. So then in 1611, uh, everything is finished. And uh, this massive book is put to market. This is a um, perfect copy of the first edition King James Bible full size. Uh, Yes, we see it with its massive uh, title page. Uh, what's significant about it is that it doesn't have any appendix. The, the last words of the Bible is the end, at the end of Revelation. There's nothing after that. But it has everything in front. It has 75 pages of preliminaries. Uh, it's a dedication to the king. And it's a very uh, good translators to the reader, where we get a lot of information about uh, the, the work with the translation was important to them. We have the Old Testament, uh, we have the Apocrypha and the New Testament. Uh, and then there's no illustrations except a map uh, and a woodcut, uh, woodcut of Adam and Eve. And that was probably because the Puritan leaning that there should not uh, be um, uh, much uh, illustrations and, and, and pictures would be simple. Let's take a cl closer look at the title page, which was uh, carved um, in, 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 in bronze uh, by Cornelius Bowl uh, from uh, Ant Antwerp. Uh, the massive, this massive title page. It's interesting when you take a closer look at it, at the top, um, we see the Tetragrammaton. That is part of the first uh, representation of the Trinity on the front page of an English Bible. We have the Tetragrammaton, the name of God in Hebrew, then representing the Father, and then we have a dove representing the Holy Spirit, and then we have the Lamb representing Jesus um, Christ. We have the, the title. We'll take a closer look at that afterwards uh, or, or now uh, we see that 
it says that the Holy Bible containing the Old Testament and the New is remarkable. It doesn't mention the Apocrypha, which is actually quite large, a part of it, the books between the, the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Testament, uh, Christian Greek Scriptures. Um, then it says that it was newly translated out of original languages with the former translations compared and revised. Um, so, yes, as I said, it's not a new translation. It is a revision of the former works. And then it says, it's interesting, it says it's appointed to be read in churches. Um, it doesn't say it's authorized. It doesn't say it's authorized. The, the Bishop's Bible said that it was um, authorized. But this one says it's appointed to be read in churches. Um, so we don't, there's actually no proof that it was ever authorized. It was commissioned, yeah, and it was initiated by, by the king, James. That's for sure. It's also interesting, and says it was appointed to be read in churches because it proves that this Bible was made to be used in the churches and to be read. So actually, in the translation committees, they would read the text aloud to each other because it was important the way it sounded because they figured that most people would get this information, would get it through the ears with someone else reading it from the pulpit or, or in the church or, or elsewhere. Yeah, and then um, when I had this in Norwegian, someone asked me what the symbol is of the swan and the chicks. Uh, that's actually a symbol that was used quite a, uh, quite a lot in the Reformation and uh, signifies uh, the, uh, Jesus Christ and, and the church and how the church feeds on, on Jesus Christ. As it says, it was printed in London by Robert Barker, printer to the king or to the kings. He was a second generation royal printer. And so he had a monopoly on printing um, Bibles, which brought him a great uh, revenue. Um, so it's a little bit of a mystery that um, he kind of went bankrupt after the printing the King James Bible. It might may be because he had to pay a hefty, a big uh, sum of money to the king uh, for this uh, privilege. But it's not known really why he went bankrupt. As I said, it carries a dedication to the King James. It's very flattering in its uh, uh, way it's written. It says that um, he was king of Great Britain and France. Well, uh, it never became any Great Britain for before many years after he he died. Um, so there was no Great Britain at the time. And uh, actually, that the King of England was also King of France was something that. Uh, was taken as part of the official title of kings and queens of England uh, for a long time after they had any kind of rulership in, in France. Um, as I said, there was a very interesting uh, document at the start in the, it's like a, pre a preface that's from the, called From the Translators to the Readers, written by Bishop Miles Smith. And there he also states that the purpose was not to make a new translation, but to make a good one better. That's what they tried to do. There's a lot of things we don't know about this most famous of, of, of Bibles. We don't know the date of its publication. Because it was not the new translation, it was not listed as like a new book to market, because it was a revision. As I said, we don't know about the authorization um, because we had uh, several fires in London after this time, especially a great fire that destroyed 80% of, of London. It's believed that many of these documents that could have given us more information were destroyed at the time. We don't know the, the number of copies it was printed in either. We don't know the, the um, what, what Robert Barker, the printer, received the print from. If there was some kind of print original, uh, it has been destroyed long ago. 
we don't know how much of the design of of the book as such that was up to the to him as a as a printer. So many things we don't know. Um, it's interesting. One of those things that we really don't know is okay. We have the title page to the to the left. That's the main title page of the Bible. Then we have the title page for the New Testament in the middle, and that is actually the title page from the Bishop's Bible that they used for the New Testament. This is uh, not a copper engraving. This is a woodcut, woodcut. Sorry, um, but also very impressive. But then to the right we have that title page now as a main title page for the King James Bible. Uh, sometime during the, the first uh, print run or print runs, something happened to the, the, the first title page in copper. Maybe uh, Cornelius Bowl took it with him when he left back to the continent. Maybe it was worn out, we don't know. And then it was continued with um, this um, woodcut um, front page instead. Uh, I think one of the things that many, when they think of the King James Bible, think of the archaic language, the, thou, die. Well, that language was already 50, 70 years old in 1611. It, was, it goes back to, uh, to fifth, um, 1540. And the, and the great Bible, it was made to appear old because that was gave, what gave authority to this Bible, that it was a continuation. It was not something new. And that's why also, uh, and because of this, this archaic language has been kept alive for 400 years due to the King James Version. I mean, in 1611, the people have started to say you instead of, 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 of thou. But because of this, it has lived until our day. So late as 1952, when we had a revised uh, standard version, which was a revision of the King James Bible, they still retained this archaic language in, in um, when people in the Bible are talking to God, for instance. And also in, in a typeface, they kept to the, they went back to the black letter. This kind of a, a Gothic, archaic looking letters, instead of using the Roman letters that the Geneva Bible had used already in 1560. So what kind of reception did this, this most famous of Bibles, the world's bestseller get? 350 years of work from scholars to make it, to support it by King and Parliament. How was the reception? It was no instant bestseller. It was huge. It was very expensive. And people had the excellent Geneva Bible. It was uh, very good and very practical and relatively inexpensive compared. So the King James Bible actually had to struggle in the shadow of a Geneva Bible still for, for a long time. 1616, the king actually banned the printing of the Geneva Bible in England to help promote uh, the King James uh, Bible. So it's, it's interesting. Today, it is a Geneva Bible that is in the deep, dark shadow of the King James Bible, right? But it was not like that in the, in the start. Um, misprints happen in old books. Uh, but the most famous misprints are usually in Bibles. And the most famous of all misprints in the King James Bible is in the so-called Wicked Bible from 1631. Where in the Ten Commandments, instead of saying that thou shalt not commit adultery, it says thou shalt commit adultery. So as you can understand, it was a huge scandal and the, um, the printers had to pay a huge fine, lost their privilege to, 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 to print, um, and uh, all remaining, all copies were uh, ordered to be destroyed. So this is one of the really sought after Bibles among, among collectors um, today, the Wicked Bible of 1631. 
Um, throughout the, the, the centuries, um, uh, you know, what happens to a book that is being printed uh, is a little bit like a manuscript that when they make a new edition, they, they set the, the type, um, the printer makes some mistakes. Those are copied again by other, other printers. Um, so you uh, kind of lose track of what was the original King James Bible like. Well, we don't really know that for sure because out of the 150 surviving copies of the first print of 1611, the so-called He Bible, um, not two of them are identical. <laughs> they are all a little bit um, uh, different. But in 16, 1769, um, Oxford University made an edition edited by Benjamin Blaney, where he tried to restore the original text of the, of the King James Bible. And some I even uh, corrected some mistakes he thought the translators had done. Um, and what is interesting about that 1769 edition is that if you go and, um, and purchase a King James Bible today, the text is 90% sure to be of the 1769 edition and not of the 1611 edition. Uh, in 2005, we got an excellent edition by specialist David Norton that was made in, in Cambridge. Um, in 1885, there was a revision of the King James Bible with a lot of scholars involved but it flopped in England. No way it repl replaced the King James Version. It was more popular in America, where it was known as the American uh, Standard Version. And then we've had um, more editions uh, since that time of that. But the, 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 the old King James is, seems to be more popular than ever, even uh, today. So as I as we know, it became the bestseller of all time. It kind of rode on the back of the British Empire. And then the United States of America was, was um, formed. Um, it became like the official Bible of that nation. When the Bible societies were formed in, in England and, and America, they printed huge numbers of, of the King James um, Version. And then as English has become the world language, the King James Version has kind of uh, rode on that back as, as well. And this journey has even taken it into space. It's, on, it's the only bubble that has, has actually been to the moon. That's the one you see on, on the right in the micro form, uh, form. And in 1968, in the astronauts on Apollo 8, um, when they witnessed the rising of the, of the earth during the lunar orbit, they're, they're quoting from the Genesis um, account to an estimated one quarter of the earth's population at that time. So yes, it's funny, it's called the authorized version in England, but it was never officially authorized there. But in America, it's not called the authorized version, it's called the King James Version of Bible but there it actually was authorized by Congress in 1782 as the only Bible ever. As I said, the first printer in, in, in England, England went bankrupt because of it. And uh, the same happened to the first printer of it in, in America. All US presidents have been sworn in by King James Version, usually Washington's or Lincoln's, but now the, the Biden, uh, Biden used uh, his family, uh, the Biden family Bible. But they're all King James Version. So, yeah, the King James Bible did not drop down from heaven like some kind of a miracle, by some kind of miracle. It was the result of a long um, development of some very uh, clever um, men. I started out uh, with, um, with these brave men, Wycliffe and then Tyndale, who is the one that has contributed the most to the text of the King James uh, um, uh, Bible. What would our King James have been without his Bible? Well, he would maybe have been known as the, the king who brought about uh, 
uh, the the uh, civil war or something like that. Um, but what would the King James Bible have been without the British Empire, United States and English as a world language? That is another matter. At the museum, we have exhibited the original pages from the first print of the 1611 Bible. We have the world's smallest Bible and the first world's smallest uh, complete New Testament on exhibition. They are both King James version. We have many other different uh, King James versions on display. We have the Geneva Bible, we have the Bishop's Bible on display, and in our shop you can buy a facsimile of the first edition King James Bible, we see here on the right, and also a, a facsimile of the 1769 edition in a folio uh, size like we see here on the, the picture. So, uh, to take the words from the, the last words from the King James Bible, the end. Thank you.